So this one may be a bit interesting, because most of us don't ever think modern CPUs could really ever be bottlenecked by their cache, and neither did I, until a few months ago when testing for a report on some software that I was helping to develop. In the group, my role was to optimise the software, of which we did exceptionally well, and in my configuration testing, I found it strange that in a workload that could decimate a 20-thread CPU, my simulated 4-core 4 4-thread 4 CPU handily beat out the 4-core 8-thread CPU. But with that, I'm Hackaroo, and this video is about cache bottlenecks. So let's go back a few months to when I was working on a group project for university, where we had to build a simpler version of some software that the university develops and licenses out, called HipHops. HipHops is a piece of engineering failure analysis software that is used to simulate, track and follow a failure throughout a system's simulation. So me and my group were tasked with building a piece of software to, at some level, replicate the functionality of the university's built software. And what this software was to do was to search a tree of components in a system and simulate a fault in the system and then track that fault through the system and report data about the faults and the components which had failed as a result of the initial fault. This was a competitive group project, so other groups were competing to have the fastest fault analysis. We used some of the most advanced techniques. Now my group was composed of people, mostly my friends, so we each took certain roles within the group. One guy did the XML IO, as all the data was to be stored in an XML format, and he was the most experienced and confident with XML. Another guy was to implement the fault tree searching algorithms and make the algorithm level optimizations quite a daunting task. Another guy was to make the GUI. And lastly, I was there to build, essentially, the glue to support everyone else's modules, plus make general code base optimizations. We decided the name Hip Replacement as a joke on the name Hip Hops and Big and Work. Right off the bat, we decided that we ought to heavily multi-thread this software in order to get the best performance. With just a generic implementation, we were told that the biggest fault tree could take in the region of 11 minutes to complete execution, and so I volunteered to spin off all of the threads for everybody else's code, essentially making the glue an entry point to everybody else's code. The reason I did this was because I had a Ryzen 7 1700X. I wanted to see something that could actually push all of these threads. As it turned out, we found that the algorithms that we were using couldn't operate on a single fault tree safely when multi-threaded. However, we could spool up a bunch of threads and stick each fault tree on its own thread, as we had a bunch of fault trees to be working on. Each fault tree was more complex and more taxing than the last, with the mother of all fault trees being called Blue Whale, of which was referred to as Moby Dick. Programmer's humour, I guess. This was the one to take 11 minutes on its own on a fairly modern CPU. However, with this new ability to put each fault tree on its own thread, I built a huge XML file with 16 Moby Dicks. We then referred to this one as Biggest Dickus. Again, some more programming humour. Anyway, as each task was independent, this theoretically ought to see perfect scaling with thread count. So if we can execute 16 on 16 threads, it ought to take the same amount of time as one on one thread. And so if it takes the same time, and we execute 16 Moby Dicks, then we can claim lower average execution time per Moby Dick. This is the concept of batch processing. Anyway, through some really interesting optimization techniques, we managed to get that 11 minute execution time down to one and a half seconds, the fastest of any undergraduate before. The next fastest group took 18 seconds, but these techniques of optimizations are a story in themselves. Anyway, this essentially made batch processing redundant. However, the topic of this video came up whilst I was testing the batch processing, and the sizes of the batches I was testing were of 8 Moby Dicks. I was then simulating the university processors, which were 6th gen i5s and i7s, so I set my Ryzen 7 to a 4 plus 0 config with SMT enabled and overclocked to 4 GHz to try and see what I could expect from the university's i7s. I ran the test four times and calculated the mean execution time. I restarted my PC, configured it in a 2 plus 2 with FSMT disabled and at 4 GHz. This was to simulate the i5s. Both CPUs were run with DDR4-2400 as that's likely 
were the OEM systems that Uni had. I ran the tests and found that the simulated i5 decimated the simulated i7. A 4-core 4-thread CPU beat out a 4-core 8-thread CPU in a workload that was able to even fully load a 16-core CPU. There had to be something going on here. The thing is, it wasn't even close. The simulated i7 took around 14.5 seconds versus the 11.5 seconds of the i5. That's a 25% lead the i5 has got in heavily threaded workloads. Now that's a head scratcher. I quickly found the problem. The i7 was run in a 4 plus 0 config, so not only does that mean that the 4 cores were located on a single CCX's L3 cache, but also a Ryzen CPU in a 4 plus 0 config disables the entire CCX, not just the cores. That means the other CCX didn't even have any of its cache activated at all, meaning that I was actually running a CPU with half of the L3 cache disabled. And when I was simulating the i5, not only did I have all of the cache available, but now there were only two cores on each CCX's L3 cache, which helped to reduce the utilization of the L3 cache. Now one thing to know is that Moby Dick was really big, really, really big. Bigger stickers took around 600 megabytes of RAM over 16 threads, and each thread working on its own fault tree had to have access to the entire fault tree, meaning that the CPU had to have had in the region of 600 megabytes of data available to it all in one go, and it has less than 20 megabytes of cache. So now you can see why halving the cache has had such an impact on the CPU's performance in this test. So now we know that the issue is the massive overloading of the CPU's cache. Let's see how much the cache is a bottleneck. If we look at the two blue whale workload, this will leave two of the four cores unutilized, leading to a very similar execution time for the slower memories, as in both configs, each core gets more cache available to it. This is shown by the memory scaling performance, shown by the TCOMP over memory frequency, as the difference between the two configs have both roughly a consistent 0.1 difference between each other over the memory frequency range, essentially showing that for two blue whales, one config doesn't increase its lead over the other one. If we look at the six blue whales, this shows us six heavy threads utilization. I feel like this is a good middle ground of CPU utilization, as the configs have four cores and eight threads. It's here that we start to see some of the more interesting results. The 2 plus 2 config pulls ahead by 51% at the slowest memory speeds. Remember, the slower memory speeds are there to highlight the cache capacity bottlenecks by making cache misses more severe. And here it shows. Both configs were running with 2400MHz RAM with 4 cores and 8 threads, but the difference in cache size meant that the 2 plus 2 config got a 51% performance improvement. This is really the turning point where all performance scaling stops. Looking at 12 blue whales, we can see that it takes the 4 plus 0 config 3600MHz RAM to match the 2 plus 2 at 2400MHz. That's just over an extra 19 gigabytes per second of bandwidth needed to match that 8 megabyte cache difference. As we see, there is a 1.2 point scaling difference between the configs at 2400 MHz RAM versus just a half point difference at 3600 MHz RAM. This shows non-linear scaling with huge performance gulfs between the two configs, with the first config being memory bandwidth limited and the second one being at 3600 MHz RAM. So to wrap it all up, all of this shows us how, in real world scenarios, the cache limits of Ryzen processors can easily be encountered, and when it is, it can be crippling. Now don't confuse this, and think that this has any reason for Ryzen's strong performance scaling with memory frequencies, as Intel actually gets the same cache capacities per core. Also, it would have been nice to have been able to test with more cores, but having up to 4 cores per CCX limits my tests to 4 cores, and testing above 12 blue whales was very difficult. The program would become really unstable with testing many blue whales at low memory frequencies, particularly in the 4 plus 0 config. Lastly, it would have been nice to test higher frequency RAM, but I was going up in 400 MHz steps, so the next step would have been a 4 GHz, and I don't have a kit rated for those speeds, but more importantly, the Ryzen chip wouldn't go that fast. The highest I've ever gotten Ryzen to 
is 37.33 megahertz. Anyway, that's all for now. I hope you enjoyed and hope you learned something.